Welcome to Come Follow Me, Act in Doctrine with Marianna Richardson, Stephanie Dibb Sorensen, and our guest today, Heather Farrell. We will be discussing today Doctrine and Covenants, sections 115 through 120. We invite our viewers at home to share their comments below about your experiences implementing the Act in Doctrine invitation. To learn more about our guest, see the biography in the video caption. Our doctrinal takeaways today are 1. The Lord has designated the name of His Church. 2. In order to be gathered with the Savior, we need to let go of things that are holding us back from being with Him. And 3. Paying our tithing prepares us for the temple. Welcome back, Heather. It's great to have you with us again. And Mariana, glad to have you join us one more time. Thanks for being here. We are going to be talking about sections 115 through 120 today. And uh, before we dive into some of the different topics that we've each chosen to talk about, Mariana, could you give us a little bit of historical background about these sections? Of course. We're dealing with a, a very similar time that we were talking about previously last time we met in that the saints are in a time of upheaval. Uh, we talked a little bit about how now they're in far west, but I think it's important to realize that Joseph Smith had also asked Newell K. Whitney and William Marks and also Oliver Granger to stay behind, to be able to take care of the financial problems that had happened in Kirtland. They were having to sell things off. They had to sell the temple. They had to sell property. They also had to take care of debts like we talked about last time. But also think about what was happening in Missouri. In Missouri, they had been in independence and been kicked out, and then they had gone to Clay County and been kicked out, and now they're in Far West, hoping for a better place. And there in Far West, that is where Joseph Smith now is also receiving these revelations that we're talking about today. And as we look forward, realize that this doesn't stop. This time of upheaval is going to continue forward as we continue to talk about what's going to happen in Missouri. Yeah. And so they're hoping for a safe haven, but they're not going to find it as we look forward to what's going to happen with Liberty Jail and some of the other things that are going to be happening to the saints. So we need to kind of think about that in context as we look at these wonderful sections where the Lord is talking very specifically to saints who are dealing with difficult things. Yeah. I mean, their hearts are probably hurting during this time, and yet it's so powerful to think and ponder on what the Lord is telling them. Yes, thank you. As you were talking about the opposition that they were facing at this time, we know that there were lots of angry mobs and local citizens who were unhappy with the Mormons. We've seen the movies about how they yell about the Mormons and Joe Smith and all of those things. And one thing that happens here in section 115 is a very simple thing that could be easy to overlook, but the Lord is giving an important reminder that our prophet, President Nelson, has also talked to us again about recently, and that is in verse 4. He says, for thus shall my church be called in the last days, even the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so this emphasis that there is a name that the Lord himself has designated for the church to use. And President Nelson, when he was sustained as the prophet, the second talk that he gave in general conference, the first talk he gave was about receiving revelation, and the second talk was actually called the correct name of the church, which seems like a very interesting thing to kind of come in with as your prophetic agenda, but it must be important. And he said, Joseph Smith did not name the church restored through him. Neither did Mormon. It was the Savior himself. Thus, the name of the church is not negotiable. When the Savior clearly states what the name of his church should be and even precedes his declaration with, thus shall my church be called, he is serious. When we omit his name from the church, we are inadvertently removing him as the central focus of our lives. For many of us, when President Nelson was teaching this principle, we thought, huh, that was kind of eye-opening that maybe we are pushing the Savior to the side a little bit when we don't use the name of the church correctly. And I wanted to ask both of you if you have had any impact or anything in your life since that challenge was given and how it's been for you to try to do that more intentionally. Well, and I think intentionally is the right word. Yeah. I think oftentimes after President Nelson gave that wonderful talk, I find myself constantly thinking, all right, am I saying the name of the church correctly? You know, sometimes I would go back and say Mormon again, and I was like, no, we're not Mormons. You know, we are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I need to make sure that I make that statement. 
My husband, who also works for the church, said that also was very positive. He would go to conferences where oftentimes he would say, I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And even though that was a mouthful, he said it did make a difference in terms of the way people saw him and also this idea, the Savior is who we are. I mean, we are the Lord's saints in the latter days. Yeah, like President Nelson said, he is at the center focus of our lives. Mm -hmm. Any well, thoughts? Yeah, and I was going to say, I think that for me, I remember feeling like this like jolt of like spiritual electricity when the church changed the name of the website to the Church of Jesus Christ. Like not even Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, right? But I was just like, oh, we are the Church of Jesus Christ. You know, like, I don't know. It, I mean, I knew that the whole time, but I was like, we are the Church of Jesus Christ. And it just made me realize um, how all-encompassing that is, I think. And it's funny because now when I go back and I read things that were written, I mean, what, like only like five years ago, right? <laughs> back in the old days. Yeah, yeah. old days when we call ourselves, when they, when they call themselves the Mormon or Mormon Church, it almost, I'm like, I'm almost like, ooh, no, no. That feels, it that's feels not really, who we are. Yeah, or even like it feels offensive now. Like with Jim, though, it wasn't offensive, right? But I'm like, no, that's not who we are. We're the Church of Jesus Christ. And I realized that for me, I just broadened my whole view of what I was a part of to realize that the Church of Jesus Christ is to gather in all believers and to gather in everyone. And I just feel like that was a really um, powerful realization for me. And I think it also is better for missionary work when I when I am approaching yeah, other people, course, like definitely. especially other Christians. But I feel like when I, you bring it with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the idea is, you know, we're, um, we're not some weird cult or not some weird group. We are here to gather all of God's children together. And I think that's a really powerful thought. Yeah, I agree. Uh, for me personally, I think the church is so much a part of my life that I talk about what I do at church and what I do because of my membership in the church and bringing the Savior's name into that is really powerful. Uh, Elder Neil Anderson gave a talk called Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, and he said, my counsel is to speak more frequently about Jesus Christ. In his holy name is great spiritual power. There is no other name given nor any other way whereby salvation can come unto the children of men only in and through the name of Christ. And so I think that there's something powerful for us as well that we are saying his name more. And um, that as we continue to do that, we call upon his power and his, and his authority. And then I also wanted to just point out quickly that President Nelson gave a promise, a powerful promise to us as a church if we would do this and use the correct name of the church as it's designated right here. He said, my dear brothers and sisters, I promise you that if we will do our best to restore the correct name of the Lord's church, he whose church this is will pour down his power and blessings upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints, the likes of which we have never seen. We will have the knowledge and power of God to help us take the blessings of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and to prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord." Jesus Christ directed us to call the church by his name because it is his church filled with his power. And I just love that wow. reminder. Well, and I think what a powerful promise, especially in our homes. Mm -hmm. Right. And we have spoken previously about not using his name in vain, but this is not what we're talking about exactly. here. We are talking about using his name intentionally and drawing upon his power as we do so. And I think it attracts believers, right? Using that name attracts believers from all over. And I feel like that's a powerful thing. Like you said, it's part of the gathering yeah. is to use that name because that's what the, what will rally around. Absolutely. So uh, changing gears really quickly, I'm kind of do a quick tangent before we go back to some con content here. In section 116, we have this little one verse that said, that was a revelation given to Joseph Smith at a place called Spring Hill. And it basically says that the Lord names this hill this place, Adam on Diamon. I just wanted to um, comment briefly about what that is and what that means. And um, Adam on Diamon, we know who Adam is. Um, there are other verses that teach us that another name for Jesus Christ is Son Amen. And according to Joseph Smith, that means that God, in the pure language, his name is Amen. And so Son Amen refers to Jesus Christ. And so this place, Adam on Diamond, is a meeting place for Adam and God. And some of the things that we 
know about this place is that it is where Adam offered up sacrifice and bestowed his last blessing and priesthood keys on posterity. All of those that were living, you know, the Enoch and all of those that were living at that time were able to receive priesthood power through him. And then we also know through Revelation that it will be a place that Adam will return at before Christ's second coming and that he will report his stewardship back to Jesus Christ and kind of hand all of that keys and dispensations and things back to the Savior. And so it's a really exciting place. And here it was right here, Spring Hill in, in Missouri. And so um, the only thing that I wanted to comment about that is that I was able to find this beautiful quote by Neil Maxwell, where he masterfully weaves together a whole bunch of scriptural verses and some words from hymns and kind of gives us an idea of the glory of this place that is Adam on Diamond. He said, the valley of Adam on Diamond will ring again this time with the sounds of dispensational reunion as it glows with gathering. Those of Enoch's utterly unique city of one heart will greet those of the new Zion with holy embraces and holy kisses amid the sounds of sweet sobbing. The hills shall tremble at the presence of the lost tribes and hearts as well as ice will melt as they come filled with songs of everlasting joy and it will all occur at the direction of the Redeemer of Israel, our only delight. Hence, as children of Zion, good tidings for us. The hour of redemption is near. Isn't that That's lovely? Beautiful. It so makes you beautiful. hope you're there, right? Like, can <laughs> I just be there when that happens? Because it's awesome. I, I think, too, when we talk about them leaving Zion, and oftentimes when I think about how heartsick they must have been as they left independence and went to far west— and sometimes I think as I read this that the Lord is saying, look, this is an amazing place too. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a spiritual place. This is a holy place. You know, don't, don't be depressed that you've left Zion because this too is a place that has a really important part in the latter days. Yes, thank you. And, um, and actually it was only five weeks later from this revelation was given that a stake was established in this exact same spot as well. It's clearly not something that's going to greatly affect the way that we're living the gospel day to day right now, but it is something beautiful to look forward to and know that it's still part of the unfolding restoration and the fullness of times when it happens. So leaving from all of those little details, let's kind of jump into some of the other things that we can learn from these sections. Um, Heather, why don't you start us off with what you were able to learn as you read? So, I was struck by the story of uh, Neil K. Whitney in um, section 117. And I did a little bit of researching on the history leading up to here and about the tensions that were in um, Kirtland, because I didn't really know a lot about that, to be honest. I didn't even realize that they had been forced out of Kirtland. I thought they just like, I don't know. I don't, yeah, to leave I believe. Or... I mean, I, now that I think about it, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. They would have just leave the temple, right? But I didn't realize that. There was a lot of apostate, you know, pressure and that a lot of the 12 had fallen away at this time and that a lot of Joseph's closest friends and, you know, people that they had been really relying on were actively fighting against the church and were actively, they were the ones that were driving the saints out of, out of Kirtland and they had taken over the temple and they had, you know, taken, started their own church and were circulating terrible things. And I just didn't realize as I was going through all the the um, the amount of persecution that was coming from, not necessarily from the people that lived in Kirtland, but from the, within the church, the people, the apostates, that Joseph Smith had had to flee basically for his life. He'd left with his family under cover of darkness and had left. And he'd asked for, you know, people, everybody basically that was loyal to him to leave and come and follow him. But Newell K. Whitney and uh, William Marks had stayed behind and taking care of some of the properties. You talked about that last time, about they taking care of some of the properties that the church was in charge of, and they were trying to sell them, but they couldn't sell them. They couldn't give them away. They couldn't get anything, right? It was interesting as I was researching more about the things that forced them out was that a lot of the apostates happened because of financial reasons, because the church had um, had started a bank called the Kirtland Security Society, mm -hmm. and it had collapsed, not necessarily because of like mismanagement by the church, but because in 1837, there was a huge financial crisis in the entire United States. And so we can relate to that, right? Having gone through that not too far in our past and lots of banks went under and lots of things. And so as a part of that, the saints lost money and Joseph Smith lost more money than anyone, but people lost money, they lost property. And that was a huge part of, 
of what had happened and why people had fallen away. And so Newell K. Whitney is um, a bishop of the church, right? And he was very involved in handling the money, right? And handling the resources and handling everything and making sure it had been distributed. It's interesting because he's, he stays longer and longer and Joseph asked him to come, you know, like come, but they're staying longer and longer in, in Kirtland. And we don't know exactly what they were doing, but they were, um, but it says here in verse 11, um, the Lord chastises Noel K. Whitney. And he says, let my servant Noel K. Whitney be ashamed of the Nicolaitan band and all their secret abominations and of all his littleness of soul before me, saith the Lord. And come up unto the land of Adam on thy almond, and be a bishop unto my people, saith the Lord. Not in name, but in deed, saith the Lord. That's an interesting thing for the Lord to have said, the Nicolaitan bands. And we don't know exactly what they're, what's referring to, but that they, that they believe that the Nicolaitans were a band in the New Testament that was led by an apostate, apostate bishop named Nicholas, who had, uh, you know, was using the church for money and gaining things like that. And so the reference is to... Um, gaining money. And 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 one of those comments I said said that um, they believe that Neil K. Whitney and William Marks were trying to, were wrapped up in the speculation at the time. You know, it was hard for them being tied up in the money to get out of that kind of trap, you know, of, of being... Yeah, kind of secret combinations to make fast money or things like yeah, that. Yeah, right. Different types of schemes, you know, how are they, you know, to, to, to gain back kind of what the saints were going to lose or what they were... So perhaps they're... Uh, their intents were right, mm -hmm. right? But I think the Lord could see where it was heading, that if he stayed there, he was going to end up a lot like these other these other people, yeah, right? It's a warning to be careful. Okay. Yeah. yeah, a warning to be careful. And the uh, part that I just really loved is in verse five, and he says, let the properties of Kirtland be turned out for debt, saith the Lord. Let them go, saith the Lord. And whatsoever remaineth, let it remain in your hands, saith the Lord. And I love, I've circled that, let them go. Because I think that, you know, he was trying so hard to make it work. And the Lord just said, walk away, get what you can, let it go, just walk away from it. And it made me think about how um, in our life, we're also being called to gather with the prophet, right? To gather with the saints, to gather with the Savior that he wants us to come and be with him. And that oftentimes we have things that we need to let go. And then we need to be able to walk away. And sometimes there's things that are keeping us from being fully with the church or being fully with the Savior that we need to be able to let go of. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about that. Well, I feel like we need to sing. You know, let, it, let, let, it, let, go. It, go. let it go. Let's not. Let's not. <laughs> yeah. But that, of course, comes to mind as you talk about that. But I do think it is an important subject, especially when we talk about the things of this world. Mm -hmm. It's so easy for us to get so involved. And I think, let it go. Let it go of our phones. Let it go in terms of, you know, other problems or issues that are, are just kind of weighing on us that are, have to do with the world, not about spiritual. Yeah. And what a powerful example for us to realize we also have to let it go. Yeah. Right. It makes me think of the conference talk where Elder Stevenson talked about picking up a rock and holding it up in front of your eye, and you pay so much attention to this that it blocks the sun, mm -hmm. right? It blocks that thing. And so, you know, it's this it's idea, like, if we would drop some of those things that we focus on so much and worry about so much, we would have more access to what the Lord is trying to give us. And I particularly love in verse 4 where it says, "For the Lord says, for what is property unto me? Like the Lord is reminding us stuff is stuff and I don't care about your stuff. There's so many other things I care about more. And I know we're going to kind of talk about that. Right. That it's not in the, in the big scheme of things, it's not what's important, you know? And I was thinking, even just in my own life, I was thinking about the let it go, whether we're holding grudges against people that, you know, or we're not forgiving, or if we're um, concerned about things in church history, if we're concerned about you know, anything like so often it's one little thing that can um, that we hang on to, you know, kind of like the like the raccoon or the monkeys that stick their hand in and grab the silver piece and are stuck and trapped because I just can't let go. And, yeah, yeah. And the power to go free is within them. They just have to be willing to let go. But that's so hard. It's so hard, you know, and I think sometimes it's hard to let go of um let go of things, you know. Have you guys experienced that before about times in your life where you've let go of something and it has been spiritually spiritually freeing? I had a situation where somebody literally stole a lot of money from our family. 
And it, you know, it was obvious he was a crook. And a matter of fact, you know, we were trying to go through litigation, trying to get the money back. But I can still remember I came to a point where I had to let go of those feelings and we couldn't go down that path anymore. And because of that story, I understand a little bit of how that can canker your soul. Yeah. How when you've lost money or, and especially if it had nothing to do with something you did, but something other people did, how that can be really painful. And to let it go is something that the Lord expects us to do, but that doesn't mean it's not hard. Yeah, that's a beautiful example. And I think that's exactly what they were, what they were feeling. And, you know, that idea, though, if you don't, eventually it does, you know, it does turn to poison in your soul. All right, so I'll just start. It's in the middle of verse 8, and he says that you should covet that which is but a drop and ne neglect the more weighty matters. And there is a story that I found by um, President Kimball that I thought was such a beautiful example of this. And one man I know of was called to a position of service in the church, but he felt that he couldn't accept because his investments required more attention and more of his time than he could spare for the Lord's work. He left the service of the Lord in search of mammon, and he is a millionaire today. But I recently learned an inter interesting fact. If a man owns a million dollars worth of gold at today's prices, he possesses approximately one twenty-seven billionth of all the gold that is present in the earth's thin crust alone. This is an amount so small in proportion as to be inconceivable to the mind of man. But there is more to this. The Lord who created and has power over all the earth created many other earths as well, even worlds without number. And when this man received the oath and covenant of the priesthood, he received a promise from the Lord of all that my father hath. To set aside all these great promises in favor of a chest of gold and a sense of carnal security is a mistake in the perspective of colossal proportions. To think that he has settled for so little is a saddening and pitiful prospect indeed. The souls of men are far more precious than this. And I was really touched and moved by that, the idea of being a millionaire or a billionaire even in today's, you know, is seems like such a huge thing, but, but according to the Lord, it, it's, it's nothing. In, in Even that is a drop. Even it's that is a drop. a drop. You're absolutely right. And as we talk about this idea of drop and weightier matters, and especially about the church going through these financial difficult times, in sections 119 and 120, the Lord is also giving the saints a way to get out of debt. We read in verse 3, And this shall be the beginning of the tithing of my people. And after that, those who have thus been tithed shall pay one-tenth of all their interest annually. And this shall be a standing law unto them forever. For my holy priesthood, saith the Lord. And then he goes on to explain in verse 6, And I say unto you, If my people observe not this law to keep it holy, and by this law... Sanctify the land of Zion unto me, that my statutes and my judgments may be kept thereon, that it may be most holy. Behold, verily I say unto you, it shall not be a land of Zion unto you. Now, I thought this was really interesting, this correlation between living the law of tithing and also sanctification and holiness. And I was really struck by Elder Robert D. Hale's talking about tithing as a test of faith with eternal blessings. And he brings this idea of tithing with temple service, and he puts them two together. He says, tithing is a test of faith with eternal blessings. The strict observance of the law of tithing not only qualifies us to receive the higher saving ordinances of the temple, it allows us to receive them on behalf of our ancestors, when asked whether members of the church could be baptized for the dead if they had not paid their tithing, President John Taylor answered, A man who has not paid his tithing is unfit to be baptized for his dead. If a man has not faith enough to attend to these little things, he has not faith enough to save himself and his friends. Tithing develops and tests our faith. So I wanted to ask you, how in your minds are tithing and temple service related. Can I just share? I was thinking as you were reading this, it stood out to me that it says in this verse that at the end he says, There shall be a standing law unto them forever for my holy priesthood, says saith the Lord. And until you read that, I never really thought that the tithing is part of priesthood. And if you think back, and here I have a little note in my scriptures too to the story of Abraham, 
that he paid all that he, he paid a tenth to Melchizedek. to Melchizedek, right? And we know that Melchizedek, we named the priesthood after him, right? And that it's kind of, they go together. I, I, that's something I'm going to have to think more about, but I just thought that that's an aspect of, of the priesthood. And it has been since Abraham and Melchizedek, that there's a, there's a sacrifice required for the power that comes. And so I'm going to have to think more about how that all ties in, but that was a, a neat connection for me to make. And then also what you were saying too, is they make that sacrifice, but anciently they did that at the temple. That's where they took the, exactly. that's where they took the tithing. And so I was thinking also about when we go to the temple now, part of the covenants that we make when we're there is the law of sacrifice, law of consecration, which means we are willing to give of what we have. And the thing that's kind of beautiful is that we, we are in the temple partially because we have paid tithing, which has helped us to be worthy to enter the temple, but it has also paid for temples. Our tithing is used specifically for the building of temples and things like that. And when you were reading that quote, something that really stood out to me that I had never thought of before is that when I go into a temple and I worship there and I receive eternal blessings, it is also because of the tithing that my ancestors might have paid like those before us have made sacrifices and paid out of their meager funds so that those temples could be built and I could enjoy those blessings. And I think that's something that's really beautiful. Well, and I love also in that section about how it brings us, it sanctifies us and it keeps us holy. Now, going back to your comment about how those funds are used and distributed in the church, in section 120, we gain an understanding of the Council for the Disposition of Tithing Funds. And in this council, we have the First Presidency, we have the Presiding Bishopric, we have the Quorum of the Twelve, but for me, the most important is at the end of the verse, and mine own voice unto them. So the Lord is a part of that council. He is the one that is overseeing that disposition of funds. And as I thought about that, I, I was thinking about people who give a lot of money to NPOs or NGOs and think that they have given it for a good purpose, and they have. For any charitable organization. Any charitable organization. And we still should help in terms of those things. But how wonderful to think that when I give to the church and realize also it's not my money, you know, it is the Lord's anyway— but on top of it, when I make that sacrifice, that I know that those funds are going to be used in a holy way, that the Lord himself is involved in terms of how those funds will be used. That gives me such great love and hope and makes me want to give my tithing more. A matter of fact, I love this quote by President Hinckley. He says, I plead with you who are church officers to plead with the people for their benefit and blessing to increase their faithfulness in the payment of tithes and offerings. There has been laid upon the church a tremendous responsibility. Tithing is the source of income for the church to carry forward its mandated activities. The need is always greater than the avail availability. God help us to be faithful in observing this great principle which comes from him with his marvelous promise. So what does that make you feel when you think that the Lord himself is helping with making sure that these funds go in the right place. So I was thinking, um, my mind is a little bit on the Old Testament and about um, in, the, in the old ancient times, people, you know, whether they were worshiping the Greek gods or any type of god, they would bring uh, sacrifices to the temple, right, of their, of their god that they're worshiping. And the reason they would bring them would be, um, you know, perhaps to seek a blessing, right? They wanted that god to look favorably upon them, to serve that god. Or they might want to uh, appease the God, right? So that the God is not uh, angry or, you know, and um, and they would take them there. And in a sense, our tithing is kind of a little similar, right? That it's it's an offering we're giving to our God. And it's made me think a little bit about, about, um, about why I do that, right? Am I looking for a, a blessing? You know, I want God to bless me. Am I looking to say, please don't send me to hell, right? Like, you know, I want to have that, you know, and I'm still trying to understand, I guess, perhaps sometimes my own reasons for paying tithing, right? But I thought when I, the, the deeper reason to pay tithing is a, is a sense of gratitude, right? Like you said, to realize that it's not yours, it's not then yours, and it's out of love that we give to the Lord, and and it's in love that He gives back. But we know what our Lord does with our offerings. We see that 
he sends them back to us in the form of temples and churches and a thousand other little ways that we receive the blessings. And that just is such a testament to me of of who the God is that I worship, right? That the offerings I give in love come back to me in love. And that's a beautiful relationship. I don't know. I feel you have to pay tithing to gain a testimony of tithing, <laughs> right? You can't just, it's absolutely you have true. to do I it before you can agree. get a testimony of it. Right? And then you feel that love right. when yes, you pay your yes. tithing. And as you feel that love, you stop looking for just blessings or the appeasement or these other things. Instead, it truly is an act of love both ways, as you brought out so yeah. beautifully. This kind of brings us back to what you were talking about before, about letting it go, right? Mm -hmm. That we have things that we hold on to, and when we are willing to sacrifice whatever it might be, whether it's tithing, money, grudges, anything like that, that the Lord blesses us because of the sacrifices that we're willing to make, and His blessing is always greater than what we give up, right? Can I share a story about that that goes along with both this? Because when my husband and I were first married, I didn't have a very strong testimony of tithing, and my husband did, and he was very, very faithful about it. And we had received a lot of money in the form of gifts for our wedding. And in my family, if you got a gift, you didn't pay tithing on a gift. And I'm every, not saying there's one way to do it, but my husband's family, they pay tithing on everything, whether it was a gift or not. And I was like, so my husband and I had this, our very first biggest battle was over if we should pay tithing on her gifts, you know? And I was like, no, that's so much money. We're so poor. There's no way we can pay it on that. And I, I was beside myself. I was so angry and I was so, I was holding on to it like nothing else. And I was so angry about it. And so finally, I remember laying on our couch in our little tiny apartment, just sobbing and sobbing. I was like, <laughs> fine, I'll pay it. We'll pay it. And so he writes out the check or, you know, takes it. And I remember going to church that day and I was just like, okay. All right, you know, just this feeling of like letting it go, but still just thinking, what are we doing? How are we going to survive? And a couple months later, I had applied for this study abroad to go to, uh, to, go to Jordan. And we received, and we didn't know how we were going to go. We just applied thinking, oh, we could maybe go. And we received this huge grant that paid for both of us to go and another student to go. I mean, tons of money. We received all this money. And I knew that that was in direction to me, have paid my tithing. And it was the first time that I had experienced that, right? That you pay and then you, and that you get in return. And I've, you know, and, and I, I've told the story to my kids and my daughter, she had heard the story. So she took her tithing to the bishop and she, I told her, if you pay your tithing, you're going to get more back. You know, it's just the way it goes. So she takes her tithing to the bishop and pays it to him and she gives it to him. And then she looks at him and she was like, aren't you going to give me any money back? <laughs> anyway, I just thought that, you know, we had talked before about, uh, about the idea that there's different levels to doing things, right? That sometimes the first step is just letting go, right? And learning that type of how it works with the Lord. And then later on, we gain different uh, motivations and reasons for doing it. So You're right. We do need to make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons and that we're not paying our tithing waiting for that blessing, blessing to, come to come back, because that's kind of what happened with the 12, and, and we're seeing this example right here, where many of them had that same issue, where they were like, okay, we gave so much up, we did so much financially, we gave so much to the church, and we are now losing everything. Right. And that was a, a real hard thing for them and their testimonies, and many people left the church because of it. We have to be careful that that's not the reason why we're paying our tithe. Well, and I would also say, just like um, if we go back last week, we talked about that idea of not just one treasure. The blessings can come in many different, in ways. Of different ways. And Elder Bednar gave that talk called The Windows of Heaven, where he right. said there are so many different kinds of blessings that come from paying tithing, and they're not always just money that comes back. But it, it sometimes is, but it's sometimes other things as well. Well, let's wrap up here. Based on this principle of letting it go, I think that maybe that would be a great place to start with our Act and Doctrine invitation this week. What do you think? Yep. Oh, I like it. And we can sing the song in our homes. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be it will great. be the anthem of the week. That's right. Yeah. So, so let's let's each kind of individually decide and prayerfully think. What is something that we need to let go of? What is something that's an obstacle that's keeping us from fully moving forward in our relationship with the Savior and make some efforts to let it go, oh. let it go, and come closer to Him? So we'll all work Love on it. that this week. Sounds perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Heather, for being with us again. And Mariana, for your comments. This has been a great discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.